Five Have Plenty of Fun by Enid Blyton. The day was too hot to do anything but laze. The five were quite content to do that on their first day together again. Soon they would want to plan all kinds of things. But the first day at Kirin was a day for picking up old threads, teasing Timmy, getting into the feel of things, as Dick said. Dick and Julian had been abroad for four weeks, and Anne had been away to camp. George had been alone at Kirin, so it was wonderful to meet together once more for three whole summer weeks. At Kirin too, with its lovely beach, its fine boating, and its exciting little islands across Kirin Bay. As usual, the first day or two passed in a kind of dream, and then the children began to plan exciting things to do. On the third day, the phone rang. Hello? Oh, hello. Yes, that's right, it's Julian. Uncle Quentin. Shall I fetch him? I... Hello? Hello? Funny. Who was it, Julian? He didn't actually say. But I think it was the American. You know, the one who came to lunch the other day. He said I was to tell Uncle Quentin that he was coming here tonight. Late, he said, and that Uncle Quentin was to wait up for him, because it was important. Dear me, is he going to stay the night, then? He didn't say, Aunt Fanny. I'm sorry I couldn't find out any more. Just as I was saying I'd fetch Uncle Quentin, he rang off. How mysterious, and how annoying. I only hope nothing's gone wrong with the work your uncle's doing. I know it's tremendously important. Perhaps uncle can ring him up and find out a bit more. Where is he, anyway? He's gone down to the post office, I think. I'll tell him when he gets back. Uncle Quentin seemed as surprised as anyone else about the phone call and was inclined to blame Julian for not finding out more details. The next morning, the children all kept out of Uncle Quentin's way. He was obviously feeling very cross. They heard him grumbling loudly to his wife. They heard him slam down his desk lid, as he always did when he was bad-tempered, and then he settled down to his morning's work. A little while later, Anne discovered that Aunt Fanny had put a camp bed in the corner of the room she shared with George. She was very cross at this news. She certainly wasn't going to have anyone else in her room. She was about to march off and tell her mother what she thought about it when the study door downstairs opened and a voice bellowed out. Fanny! Tell the children I want them. Tell them to come to my study at once. Gracious! Whatever can we have done? No idea. We'd better go anyway. We're here, Quentin. Uh, good. Uh, because I've got something important to say that concerns all of you. You remember those two friends of mine, scientists working on a scheme with me? You remember the big American? Yes. Well, he's got a daughter. Let's see now. She's got some silly name. Berta. Uh, don't interrupt me, Fanny. Uh, yes, Berta. Well, Elba, her father, has been warned that she's going to be kidnapped. Whatever for? It so happens that he knows more about a new scheme we're planning than anyone else in the world. And he says that if this girl... Berta! That if this Berta is kidnapped, he will give away every secret he knows to get her back. <sighs> What's he made of? How can he even think of giving away secrets for the sake of a silly girl? Quentin! She's his only child and he adores her. I should feel the same about George. Yes, it's a good thing you don't know any secrets. You give them away to the milkman. <laughs> this is no laughing matter. Anyway, he came to ask me if we'd take this, this Berta into our own home for three weeks. By that time, the scheme would be finished and launched and our secrets will be safe. But why has she got to come here? She has no relations in this country, dear, and no other friends they can trust. Don't worry, Aunt Fanny. We'll look after Berta. Thank you, Julian. I know you all will. Huh. When is she coming, anyway? Tonight, by boat. 
We'll let Joan into the secret, but nobody else. Understood? Of course. I suppose so, but I bet Timmy will hate her. Now don't go and make things difficult, George. We're all agreed it can't be helped. So for the rest of the day, the children all tried to have as good a time as possible and went out in George's boat for a long row to Lobster Cove. Aunt Fanny had again packed them a wonderful lunch. They had enough food for tea too and didn't get home until the evening. The sea was calm and blue and the children could see almost to the bottom of the water when they leaned over the side. The sky was the colour of harebells as they rowed into the bay. Then they made their way to Kirin Cottage. After supper, all four went upstairs. Anne and Dick yawning loudly and setting the others off too. Timmy padded behind them, quite glad that George was going to bed so early. They were all asleep in ten minutes. The boys slept like logs and didn't stir at all. The girls fell fast asleep for about four hours and then George was awakened by hearing Timmy growl. She sat up at once. After a minute, Timmy growled again. George heard the sound of quiet footsteps on the stairs. Then the bedroom door was slid softly open and two people stood in the light of the landing lamp. One was Aunt Fanny. The other, of course, was Berta. Tell Timmy not to make a sound, George. Shh, Tim, shush. This is Berta, George. She's been terribly seasick, poor child. Oh, now let's get these things off. What am I to call you? Oh, you'd better call me Aunt Fanny as the others do, I think. I expect you know why you've come to stay with us, don't you? I don't want to come. I'm not afraid of being kidnapped. I, I've got Sally to look after me. Oh, Sally, dear. My dog. She's downstairs in the basket. A dog? We can't have a dog here. Mine would never allow that, would you, Timmy? <coughs> well, I brought my dog, and, and she'll have to stay now. I wouldn't go anywhere without Sally. Mother, tell her how fierce Timmy is. I won't have anybody else's dog at Kieran Cottage. Don't be silly, George. Now, Berta, come on. Let's be getting you into bed. Pops, that's my father. Always let me have Sally in my room, sleeping on my feet. She will not. No dog sleeps in my bedroom except Timmy. Now, don't talk any more. We can settle everything tomorrow when you're not so tired. I'll look after Sally tonight for you, Berta. I promise. She can sleep in Timmy's kennel. Now, lie down, the both of you. Go to sleep. All right. Good night, Mother. George was first awake in the morning. She had once remembered the events of the night before and looked across at Berta in the camp bed. The girl was asleep. Her wavy golden hair spread over the pillow. George leaned across Anne's bed and gave her a sharp nudge. What's the matter, George? Time to get up. Look over there. Bert has arrived. Where? Oh, yes. She looks all right. She's soppy. And she brought a dog with her. And <laughs> Timmy won't like that. Where is it? Down in Timmy's kennel. Berta actually wanted it with her in the bedroom. Imagine. I can't think what Timmy will say. Neither can I. It's a pity Berta isn't our kind. Look at her pale face. She looks really weedy, doesn't she? I'm sure she couldn't climb a tree or row a boat or... She's waking up. Oh. Hello. You weren't there when I went to bed. I was surprised to see you in the morning. I came in the middle of the night by boat. The sea was so bumpy, I got real sick. Bad luck. You didn't enjoy the adventure, then? No. I guess I can do without adventures. I'm not keen on them, especially when Pops gets all excited and worried about me. The thing is, adventures come up all of a sudden, like a wind blowing up in the sky. 
And then we're all in it, whether we like it or not. I say, look at the time. Isn't it time we got up? Yes, unless Berta wants to have her breakfast in bed. I bet she always does at home. I do not. I hate meals in bed. I'm going to get up. Gee, I wonder why the room was so full of brilliant light. Now I know. What a view. And what's that little island out there? That's Kieran Island. It belongs to me. Belongs to you. I bet you wish it did. It's really wonderful. Wonderful? Can't you say wonderful? It's got a D in the middle, you know. Yes, I'm always being told things like that. I do try, because I've got to go to an English school. My, my. I wish that island belonged to me. I wonder if my pops could buy it. Buy it? You donkey, I told you it was mine, didn't I? But you didn't mean it, did you? Yours? How could it be? It is George's. It's always belonged to the Kieran family. That's Kieran Island. George's father gave it to her. Great snakes, really? Aren't you the lucky one? Will you take me to visit it? We'll see. Hey, you girls! Are you getting up? We'll all be too late for a dip before breakfast this morning. Bert is here. We're getting dressed now. Are they your brothers? Yes. That's Julian and Dick. You'll like them, I'm sure, won't you, George? Yes. Oh, 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 oh. Come here, Timmy. Come away from Berta. You're making a nuisance of yourself. Oh, he's not. I like him. <laughs> he seems enormous after Sally. But you'll love her, George. You really will. What's that? It's the gong to say breakfast ready. Come on. You sit down there, dear. Right. Who's this? Now, Quentin, don't pretend you don't know. It's Elba's girl. Your friend, Elba. She came in the middle of the night. Ah, yes, yes. Oh, glad to have you here. Um, let me see. Now, what's your name again? Berta. Ah, yes, Berta. I know your father well, you know. He's doing some wonderful work. Oh, he's always at work. He works all through the night sometimes. You often do that yourself, Quentin. Though I don't suppose you even realise it. Really? Well, don't I go to bed some nights, then? <laughs> he would like my pops. Sometimes he doesn't know what day of the week it is. And he's supposed to be one of the cleverest guys in the world. Oh, yes, uh, yes. Coffee, Quentin? How's this? Unless I'm very much mistaken, here's a letter from your father. Coffee, Quentin? I'll see what it says. I'll take that as a yes. Uh, some for me, too, please, honey. Oh. It's uh, all about you, um, um... Her name's Berta. Uh, about you, Berta. I must say, your father has some very strange ideas. Yes, yeah, very strange. Like what? Well, he says here... She must be disguised in case anyone comes to find her here. And he wants us to call her by a different name. Oh, well, that's sensible. But bless us all, he wants us to cut her hair short and dress her as a boy. I won't! I won't be dressed as a boy! I won't have my hair cut! I, I won't! I won't! I won't! After breakfast, Berta went with Anne to get Sally. She was a tiny black poodle. Everyone but George exclaimed in delight. Timmy stood by George, sniffing hard to get a smell of this new dog. The poodle stared at him out of her bright little eyes, quite unafraid, her funny little tail wagging merrily. Then Timmy went up to her and sniffed her nose. He licked it gently and then lay down in front of her. Peace reigned in the house for a little while. George and Anne went to help Joan the cook with the washing up. She'd been astonished that morning to find a fifth child added to the household, but had been told that after breakfast she could go into the sitting room and hear an explanation. Soon all five children and the two dogs and Joan were in the sitting room with Aunt Fanny. Joan, you've always known what important work my husband does. Well, Berta's father does the same kind of work in America, and he and Quentin are working on a great new scheme together. Oh, yes. 
Well, we've heard some very distressing news. Berta's father has been warned by the police that it is possible Berta may be kidnapped. Kidnapped? I'm afraid so. And held to ransom. Not for money, but for the scientific secrets that he knows. So Berta has been sent to us to be kept safe for three weeks. By that time, the scheme will be finished and made public. I see. Berta is going to the same school as Anne and George, and it's a good idea to let them know one another first. We understand. I think we can keep Berta safe all right, don't you? Yes, but her father has now put up some more ideas he wants us to follow. He says it would be best to disguise her as a boy. Jolly good idea. And to give her another name, a boy's name. He wants us to have her hair cut short. Oh, please, not that. I hate it. Girls with short hair like boys look so silly. They... I think we'll have to do what your father says, Berta. You see, if anyone comes here looking for you, they would never recognize you if you looked like a boy. But my hair! How could Pop Sam to have my hair off? He always said it was wonderful. Your hair will grow quickly enough. But what about clothes? Girls look frightful in boys' clothes. Pop's always said so till now. You won't look any worse than George does. She's got boys' clothes on now. I think she looks awful. Well, I think you'd look horrible, too. You wouldn't even look like a boy. You'd look little girlish. Silly little sissy boy. Ah, our George wants to be the only one. Well, I'll go out and buy some things for Berta this morning. Then shall I cut her hair? You can certainly go shopping for Berta if you like. But I'd rather you didn't cut her hair. You'd make her look like a scarecrow. Now, what about a name? We can't call you Berta anymore, that's certain. Well, I don't want a boy's name. It's silly for a girl to be called by a boy's name, like George. If you mean to be rude to me, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> oh, George, you and Bert will be the death of us. And I'm sorry, but you'll have to have a boy's name, Berta. Well, let me use my second name, then. It's used for a boy, too, only then it's spelt differently. It's Leslie. It's a nice name, I think. Leslie. Yes, it rather suits you. All right, then. Everything's settled. Not quite. I just want to say that you mustn't let Berta, uh, I mean Leslie, out of your sight at all. The local police here know that we have Leslie with us and why, and anything can be reported to them at once. There. That's about it, I think. You know, it's very odd. But she does look rather like a boy. Oh, let me see. Where's the mirror? Oh, I look awful. I don't know myself. Nobody would ever recognize me. Splendid. That's absolutely right. Nobody would recognize you now. Your father was right to say cut your hair off and dress you as a boy. Oh. Stop crying now, Berta. Uh, Leslie, come on. You've been very good to sit still all that time. I must think of a little reward for you. Oh, oh, please. The only thing I want is to have Sally Dog to sleep with me. Oh, dear, Ber Leslie, I really can't have another dog in that little bedroom. Berta could have her camp bed in my room. I don't mind the dog if Berta... Oh, I mean, Leslie doesn't mind sharing. Oh, Joan, that's good of you. And your bedroom's in the attic. Kidnappers wouldn't think of looking in your room for one of the children. Thank you, Joan. You're just wonderful. Wonderful! Yes, the word is wonderful. Won't you ever get it right? <laughs> I'd like to know how I can get on with my work with all this hooting and cackling going on. Who's this? Don't you know, Father? Of course not. Never seen him in my life. Don't tell me it's somebody else come to stay. It's Berta. Berta? Now, who's Berta? Seen him heard that name before. The girl you thought might be kidnapped? Oh, Berta Elba's girl. Good heavens. Why, your own father wouldn't know you. I just hope I remember who you are. Well, I must get back to my work now. You children had better have lunch at home today. It's too late now to start making sandwiches for a picnic.
Is there time for a bathe? Yes, if you come in at about 12 o'clock. Good. Let's go, then. Come on, everyone. Soon they were down on the beach. It was fun to be five, fun to chase one another in the sea, to swim under the water and grab somebody's leg. Anne laughed till she choked when she saw somebody heave themselves out of the water right onto George's back and duck her well and truly. It was Berta, and what was more, George couldn't catch her afterwards. Berta could swim much too fast. She could dive well too and swim underwater even longer than the boys could. Sally the Poodle was a great success as well. Even George couldn't go on disliking the happy, dancing little dog. She trotted and capered about, and Timmy was her adoring slave. Another day passed peacefully by, and the five children and two dogs were out of doors all day long, swimming, boating, exploring, really enjoying themselves. Berta wanted to go over to Kirin Island, but George kept making excuses not to go. The others kept on at her, and eventually she said that perhaps they could go the next day. But when it came, something happened that upset their plans for going to Kirin Island. A telephone call came for Uncle Quentin, and immediately he was in a panic. Penny! Penny, where are you? Pack my bag at once, at once, do you hear? Quentin, whatever is it? Elba says he's found a mistake in our calculations. It's nonsense. Why can't he come here and work? Tell him to come here, Quentin. I'll find a bed somehow. He says he doesn't want to while his daughter, what's her name, is here. Oh, he's probably right. If any kidnappers followed him, they'd soon find out where she was. Well, that's what I was trying to tell you. Anyway, I must go to Elba straight away. So, so pack my bag, please. I'll be back in two days' time. In that case, I'll go with you, Quentin. I could do with a quiet two days. Will you really come with me? I thought you'd hate to leave the children. It's only for two days, and Joan is very good with them. They'll be quite safe. In any case, I'm beginning not to believe that tale about kidnappers. I expect Elba just got into a panic when he heard the rumour. The children were told of the sudden decision when they got back to lunch that day. Joan had to tell them because Aunt Fanny and her husband had already departed. Then that night when everyone in Kirin Cottage was asleep, a black cloud crept up the sky and blotted out the stars one by one. A low roll of thunder came. It was far off, only a rumble, but it woke Anne. She got quietly out of bed and padded over to the open window. Then she heard another sound, the chug-chug-chug of a motorboat. It sounded quite far out in the bay. Now she saw a light, very faint, out at the entrance of the bay. It shone for a while, moved here and there, and then disappeared. Anne was puzzled. She thought that perhaps the motorboat was behind Kirin Island. The island would hide the boat and its lights. But what was the moving light she saw? Was it someone on the island? Anne's eyes were getting so sleepy she could hardly keep them open. There was no more thunder and no lightning at all. She yawned and crawled into bed. In the morning, Anne had almost forgotten her watch at the open window the night before. The five children and two dogs went off down to the beach. Chasing Timmy in the sea. Aren't they having fun? You're telling me. Oh, you smell of seaweed, Timmy. Oh, I don't want you lying next to me like that. <laughs> I say, look, all of you. What is it? There's someone on Kieran Island. Though I can't see them. Someone lying down, looking through binoculars at our beach. Can you see the sun glittering on the glasses? Yes, you're right. Gosh, what's a cheek? Cheek? It's a lot more than cheek. How dare people go on my island? That reminds me. I thought I saw a light on Kirin Island last night, too. When? There was thunder which woke me up. I got out of bed, hoping to watch a storm. 
but it didn't come. Then I heard a motorboat far out in the bay, but I couldn't see any lights, except for a faint moving one I thought was on Kieran Island. You could have woken me. Well, I may have been mistaken. I was very sleepy. Well, if there was someone there last night, I doubt if it's trippers. And it does seem a bit odd that anyone should be using the island to spy from. Perhaps it's kidnappers. Yes. If it occurred to them that Berta might be with us, it would be a good idea on their part to land on the island and use it to spy on the beach. Well, I think we should go across now and chase them away, whoever they are. First, we ought to consider whether that's a sensible thing to do, to go to the island with possible kidnappers there on the lookout for Berta. Leslie, I mean. We could go without her. We could leave her with Joan. That would be a foolish thing to do. Anyone watching us coming across would see that one of the five was missing and would guess at once it was Bertha. No, if we go, all of us must go. They decided to go to Kirin Island immediately after lunch and told Joan what they had seen on the island. She took a grave view of it and said they should ring the police and Julian promised they would if they found anything suspicious. Soon all five children and the dogs were in George's boat. The boys took the oars and began to pull hard towards the island. Timmy stood on the prow as he loved to do, four paws on the edge of the boat. Berta gazed eagerly at the little island as they drew near. She'd heard so many tales about it, how lucky George was to own an island like this. There was a smooth inlet of water running between rocks, making a natural little harbour. The boat slid smoothly into the inlet and up to the beach of sand. Dick leapt out and pulled it up the shore. Then George led the way up the sandy beach to the rocks behind. Bertha? Rabbits! Thousands of them! Why, they're everywhere. Are they tame? No, but they haven't learned to run away properly either. That's because not many people come here and frighten them. Whoever was here this morning scared them all right. Gosh, don't let's forget there may be people here. Well, I can't see anyone so far. Let's make for the top. Cigarette ends. Look! Fresh ones, too. There are people here, that's certain. Walk ahead of us, Tim. What was that? What? I thought I heard something. It's a motorboat. That's what I heard last night. They're escaping. Quick, let's run up there. We may see them. There it is, a motorboat. Pity we haven't brought our binoculars with us. Why didn't we think of it? They must have anchored their motorboat out there and somehow clambered ashore over the rocks. Yes. And if they came last night, they must have clambered to the shore in the dark. It must have been the light of a lantern or torch you saw on the island last night then. They probably didn't want to be seen arriving on the island. And that's why they went to the seaward side. I wonder if they were men spying to find out if Bertha is with us or not. They all went back soberly to Kirin Cottage and told Joan what had happened on the island. A letter had arrived while they were out to say that George's mother and father were staying away a whole week. Complications had arisen, the letter said. Julian made up his mind to guard Bertha every minute. Thank goodness they had Timmy. Nobody would dare do any kidnapping under Timmy's eye. He thought it was a good idea to put Timmy in Joan's room that night. In fact, if George agreed, it would be best to do that each night. Later that evening, the five children sat round the table playing cards. Julian and Berta sat side by side, as Julian was helping her. She looked exactly like a very earnest little boy with her straight, close-cut, fair hair. George sat opposite the window, with Dick on one side of her and Anne on the other. Now who 
whose turn is it? Oh, yours, George. Your turn, Dick. Dick, come on. Do buck up. You're slow tonight. All right. Hey! What is it? What is it, George? Out there! Look! A face! I saw a face peeping in at us through the window. Timmy! Timmy, quick, go after him! Where is he? Timmy! <coughs> Where were you? <coughs> Idiot! Jump out of the window! Go on! Chase him! Find him! What on earth is going on in here? Listen! Shut up, Sally! Listen! He's got away, whoever it was. You nearly scared the life out of